there are problems with um, ECMO, of course, as well, and there are a few things one needs to know if, uh, if you run them. Some, some are common, like this one, venous drainage problem. Okay, you have to consider that you have to drain about three to six liters of blood a minute, so basically the whole cardiac output, from uh, a centrally positioned uh, catheter or sometimes two catheters if the flow is not quite enough. And what easily happens if you've got a limited preload or limited venous filling, uh, your vein will collapse and the, the pump will just not be able to pump enough blood out there. So this is what you see in the early stage. Hopefully it works, there we go. So you see slight movements in the tubing there, we call it chattering, um, and um, probably a slight change in, uh, in your, your flow parameters as well, only a few milli, uh, hundred millimeters, milliliters up and down, but that's the first warning sign. And if your intensivist uh, is not busy playing with the iPhone recording at all, uh, <laughs> you will probably uh, be able to fix it at that point by setting, resetting the, um, the parameters and or give some fluid, just increasing the, the preload. However, that wasn't the case here, so that's the next stage, as you can see. We've got a suck down now, so basically the whole uh, ECMO flow diminishes to zero. If you've got a VV ECMO on, the patient's gonna be completely def uh, dependent on his ventilation, which is not existing, so they turn blue in no, no time. And if they're on VA ECMO, they become hypotensive at the same time as well. So that's, that's how it looked like, so vigorous shaking and uh, if you would have a look at our uh, flow meter there, your, your blood flow would come down to almost zero. Well, it's not too bad. As you can see, I'd fix it actually in a few seconds eventually. There's no movement there anymore. Um, what you have to do in that emergency setting, you can't just wait for fluid to go in. It's far too late actually. Um, what we do is you just turn down the flow to zero for a few seconds only. So that allows the cannula to uh, disconnect from the from the venous wall again and free float again in, in the in the vessel and then you slowly increase the flow again. The patient will probably be not optimally um, saturated at the time, but still, it actually helps um, with the um, with the stabilization of the patient. Then, secondary, if that happens more often, obviously you have to think of. Is your cannula at the right position? Do you have to have another cannula to drain from a different side to get enough blood flow up? Or, of course, the other option is, do you really have to run such a high flow you're currently running? Because in the end, and we come to that actually, p some people claim that um, venous flow, or sorry, v uh, saturation on VV ECMO um, might, uh, 80, oh, well, 85 to 90 percent of saturation might be good enough, actually, and you may not achieve much more. If you're more aggressive with drainage, you achieve more. We usually try that, in fact, but uh, um, you may be happy with that kind of saturation as well. Okay, other complication. This is, again, specific for, for VV ECMO, and this is recirculation. So this is your uh, return cannula here, and all the oxygenated blood meant to go into the right atrium and then through the lung. Of course, that doesn't happen all the time. So some of the blood, unfortunately, in this case, gets sucked up back into the drainage cannula. So there's recirculation happening, and this, I'm not sure that's gonna show up well. But this is a venous drainage cannula from up the top there. And as you can, if you look very closely, you may see that the color of that blood drained is changing with the, with the heart rate. So in, in systole, basically, most of the blood gets diverted into the drainage cannula straight away, and you've got oxygenated blood coming out of that cannula while in diastole, most of the blood gets sucked into the right atrium and right ventricle. So that again tells you that maybe your cannulation position is not optimal or you just have to um, address it. Okay, one other problem. That's the one I was just talking about before. Obviously, you try to, or if you want to achieve optimal oxygenation, you would have to drain the whole cardiac output into the ECMO and give it back oxygenated, since you can assume that lung function is next to nothing. That's not gonna happen most of the time, so there's always a portion of, of blood returning, actually, and going to where it's supposed to go, the right atrium, right ventricle, and going there unoxygenated. 
So we try to minimize that. There are a few ways to do that, either by optimizing the ECMO, optimizing the filling, but also uh, optimizing the cardiac output. You can slow down the cardiac output in many patients there, and if that happens, you are, you're more likely to drain uh, a considerable amount of cardiac output, actually, into the ECMO oxygenated and give it back. Okay, so that's shunt. Other complications, for, this is specific for VA ECMO now. We talked about limb ischemia as a problem already. Without that backflow cannula, um, the incidence of that is probably somewhere around 20 to 30 percent. And if it happens, we only had it a couple of times, but if it happens, it's pretty bad. Not only that you have to uh, do major surgery like an amputation there, you run into bleeding issues, you run into hemodynamic problems a lot. So um, we always put a, a backflow cannula in, and that usually um, is possible relatively, it's, it's possibly to do that percutaneously, and it avoids limb ischemia. Other co uh, problems associated with that, and that's maybe a bit more complex. Now, we've got VA ECMO established here. Your return cannula um, is here, so it pumps blood into the aorta. We relax because this one, this is now creating your cardiac output. Your blood pressure is okay, you could reduce the inotropes. We can forget about the heart if you want. It's not quite true, because the problem is now that if you, if you um, allow the heart not to eject at all, there's still some blood returning from the lungs, which is not oxygenated. And usually there's a bit of uh, aortic valve regurge as well. So over time, the left ventricle and subsequently left atrium and the lungs will flood. So you will see APO, you will see pulmonary hemorrhage, you will see LV distension. And you will see, since it's more or less static, you will see intracardiac uh, thrombus happening as well. So we always try to make the patient eject at the same time. Okay? That's e relatively easy to monitor. You've got your arterial uh, wave monitor, pressure monitor obviously on. And uh, if there's no ECMO or no cardiac output, you will have a flat line because it's a non pulsatile pump. But if you've got some ejection happening, you will have some pulsatility. As long as that is happening, uh, you're probably fine. You won't have these complications. Okay. Now, the opposite can happen as well, though. And this is what we call differential hypoxia. So again, you give blood back here into the aorta, which is well oxygenated. However, now our heart is pumping well. It's about to recover. However, our lungs are not for whatever reason. So whatever gets ejected out here, out the left ventricle, is uh, hypoxic blood. And uh, that obviously mixes somewhere uh, in the distal uh, or descending aorta with the well oxygenated blood. So you end up with the awkward situation of having pink toenails, but uh, unfortunately uh, a brain which is hypoxic. Okay. So whenever you've, we've got someone on VA ECMO, we try to measure um, our, we put our pulse oximetry onto the right arm or even on the forehead to make sure that you don't have any um, of this happening at the same time. And it also highlights the fact that you have to still concentrate on cardiac output, as I said before, but also on, on lung function while someone is on VA ECMO. So VA ECMO is not as straightforward and, uh, and easy to do. You just take over heart and lung, so why should you bother? It's actually more complex than venous venous ECMO in, in many cases. So whenever we, we only got a primary and pulmonary problem, we, we tend to put them on VB ECMO. Right. Now other complications, obviously we're getting into anticoagulation and clotting. Um, Starting here with clotting, these are data from the ELSO database, the registry of a few thousand cases uh, around the world now. And you can see clotting inside the ECMO circuit is happening, but it's not happening that, that often, actually. We've got 20% in the registry. Our incidence is probably about 12 to 15%. Um, and usually these clots are, are not of major concern. We'd had to change our oxygenators out of our 140 cases about um, 15 or 18 times. 
So it's not too bad. And all or most of these oxygenator changes have been semi-elective. So we've seen some clots. We're just not worried if the patient's going all right for the next 24 hours. And we don't like to get our perfusions in in the middle of the night because they're quite grumpy then. So um, we decide to do it at daytime and, and do the oxygenator change. But it's not happening very often. The reason, so I'll come to that in a minute. So what about the opposite? Bleeding. And I think that was actually uh, the killer, at least in the, in the initial phase of ECMO. And as you may know, ECMO was around until the 70s. These two trials up there, first randomized control trials on ECMO in the 70s and then in the 90s. And as you can see here, they've both been negative for some reason. As you can see, blood loss in the first trial in the 70s, 2.5 liters a day. Blood replacement in, in 1994, 2.7 liters of PEC cells every day. So they've had a full plasma exchange every day on ECMO. I guess if you want to make someone recover from a major pulmonary incidence, so that's, that's not going to happen if you have, have such a, a massive transfusion <coughs> happens throughout. That has slowed down, though, after 2000. In 2005, uh, this publication basically rated um, 700 mils a day of blood, still quite a bit, and we are probably more around that number, 400 mils a day, uh, if at all. Of course, they are, the post-surgical cases would take more, but our lung VV ECMO H1N1 patient rarely took any blood. So it's less of an issue as well at this time. Now, the major complication with bleeding as well as with clotting is obviously neurologic. Uh, again, the incidence is not that high, 2.5, 2% of intracranial hemorrhage or intercerebral ischemia in, in the ELSO database. Our numbers are fairly similar uh, to that. We've got a few more ischemias, while um, the last year's publication in the ANZ ECMO trial out of 68 cases, we had six bleeders. It might just be random, but uh, it is uh, a bit more than you would like to have, although the outcome overall of that trial was, was very good. 